Um, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm very honored to be uh, invited to speak here at the center. As an American architect, uh, it's an institution that I've always really admired and been able to visit um, on a number of occasions. Um, and what Mirko asked me to do uh, sort of after the closing of the digital archaeology uh, or archaeology of the digital exhibition, which has, the, has come through the university where I teach and was co-curated by um, my faculty colleague, Greg Lynn, was to talk a little bit about a different dimension of how technology has affected what we do as architects and what processes we use. Um, and this topic is sort of falls in the strange intersection of the three parts of my career. I was, um, or I guess I still am, a practicing architect and practiced for about 20 years, um, as was mentioned, uh, as a principal in Caesar Pelli's office in my last role. But in Caesar's office, I was a design manager. My job in that firm was to make sure that the design that we formulated actually got done. And, and as an architect, my interest has always been in, in questions of processes and outcomes. Uh, then I left Autodesk, in, uh, or left uh, Pelly's office in 2000 and uh, became an executive in a software company, Autodesk, where I worked um, on a lot of stuff that I'd never done before, including the whole BIM extravaganza. Um, I actually created the term building information modeling, and it was my team that um, took the company's strategy from drafting in the form of AutoCAD to building information modeling. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then the third dimension of the things at least that I've been thinking about is I've been teaching professional practice at Yale um, for almost 30 years now. And professional practice is a topic that uh, many graduate architects come to with a great deal of uh, trepidation, uh, concern, uh, expectation of intense uh, boredom um, and depression. And so one of the ways I've tried to keep that course interesting is by creating a dialogue with my students about the sort of the normative and the new, the, 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 the normal practice of architecture and then crit critiques of what might be coming. And so what I want to talk about tonight is a completely different dimension that's almost in many ways orthogonal to what Mirko and Greg and their team did with the three exhibitions here. I want to talk about the implications on process and roles and responsibilities uh, of technology on how we practice architecture. Um, and I, so I, was, I got here a little early today so I could look around and I was browsing in the bookstore and I, I came across this, um, I came across this really interesting text called The, the Architecture of Neoliberalism which is a topic that my uh, colleague Peggy Deemer and I are doing some work on by Douglas Spencer. And um, I, the very first paragraph really struck me, so I'd like to read it to, read it to you. Swarm-modeled figures dispersed across smooth space, steered between buildings, channeled along elevated walkways. The architecture is fluid. Its forms materialize out of thin air or extrude themselves into existence. The pleats, grills, and apertures patterning their surfaces seem subject to the same unseen forces. There are no signs of labor. Threaded between the buildings and pathways, sometimes woven into the architectural envelope, are the green spaces that signal sustainability, deference to the laws of nature. The trajectory of the virtual camera as elegantly choreographed as that of the environment it records, as it spirals around the site, tracking pathways, banking over structures and hovering momentarily over details. The sonography of the contemporary architecture, of contemporary architecture, the friction-free space supposed to liberate the subject from the strictures of both modernism and modernity, to reunite it with nature, to liberate its nomadic, social, and creative dispositions, to re-enchant its sensory experience of the world, to conjoin it with the technology itself, now operating in accordance in accord with the very laws of the material universe, with emergence, self-organization, and complexity. And I thought as I, as I, I had chosen this image from my colleague Mark Gage um, when I put the talk together, but when I read that, I realized that what Spencer had described there is the, uh, much of the aspiration of technology as it's been applied to the problem of architectural design really for the last 20 years that mostly our architects largely consider 
technology as instruments of um, freedom and as uh, techniques by which they can create a different set of expressive ideas, and I think that's true. And it's clear that um, a, a whole different genre of form making has emerged. But as I said earlier, I'm not, um, my interests are actually elsewhere. My interests are in the implication, not so much of, of formal questions, but of process and what the implications of process are. My, we have a new dean at Yale now, but my former boss, um, Bob Stern, used to refer to the work of folks that used computation to make complex forms as the blobmeisters. And I'll stipulate that maybe the blobmeisters actually um, are interrogating and extrapolating technology in different sorts of ways. Uh, and doing so uh, in a way that creates one particular set of opportunities. But what I want to suggest to you is that form optimization or the use of different kinds of computational techniques to explore form is but the very, very beginning, and at least in my view, one of the least important implications of the evolution of, of the technologies that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, because I think that there are large questions of the role of the architect in the overall process, and the technology remediates the role of the architect in a number of different kinds of ways. Um, this is uh, Greg's uh, uh, embryo embryological house where he did, he did this project in, what was it, America? It was 1999, right? Yeah. yeah. And he was using a combination of two uh, technologies that have become really preeminent in form generation today. He was using animation software made by, by our company, and he was using a technique called scripting, which was writing rules, sets of rules, that uh, created his 20,000 variations on a house. And he, I think he referred to them at Yale as his 20,000 children, and he couldn't pick his, he couldn't pick his favorite. Um, and so the technology there was really used to explore a certain limited set of formal questions. But what's beginning to happen as we, as we traverse the 21st century is that computation provides a different set of opportunities. And those opportunities are anticipated by ideas like the embryological house, but they, they actually veer in a completely different direction. They veer in the direction of simulation and prediction and the, and the understanding in a, sort, in a sort of deep way of the outcomes of the design process that are beyond just the formal questions. And so I'm not really here, and I don't really think it's my role to critique the formal implications, or at least that's not the topic of the conversation tonight, but what I want to suggest to you is that there are other profound implications for what we do as architects, uh, perhaps as profound as the sorts of uh, redefinitions of the role of the architect as occurred in the Renaissance. And really one of the most important turning points in the definition of the practice of architecture, two of them were happening simultaneously um, at the end of the Enlightenment. At the end of the Enlightenment, um, the first, of course, was Brunelleschi, who articulated the very romantic notion that the idea of design, expression, control of construction, and understanding of the building enterprise were completely conflated in a single entity called the master builder. And my former colleague Mario Carpo, who's now at the Bartlett, um, used to tell this story at Yale about. Brunelleschi was such a control freak about being the master builder as he um, was designing and, and um, managing the construction of the, of the dome over the Duomo in Florence that he um, would make study models out of radishes, if you guys heard this story. He'd be out in the field talking to the construction workers and he would, he would make a sketch in three dimensions by carving a radish and then he would show the radish to the construction worker and then he would eat the radish so he was the only one who had any memory of that transaction. So he was sort of taking the, the traditional means of transmitting information and destroying it in each sort of subsequent um, construction transaction. And, and we know that Brunelleschi controlled, fiercely controlled all the details of construction. But at the same time that, uh, that Brunelleschi was working, Alberti was writing you know, the seminal treatise, which really defined the um, profession of architecture, 
um, which was you know, his text on architecture. And in, our, in, in, that, in that treatise, what Alberti asserted is that models, intellectual models, ideas, are separate from building. Up to that particular historical moment, the, I, the ideation of a building and the construction of the building were, were considered to be one phenomenon. And what Alberti said was that the ideas are actually more important and that the architect should pre-conceptualize the building with such clarity and such, um, uh, such uh, sort of distinct, distinctly instructive descriptions that the, when the construction actually began, the construction should adhere slavishly without deviation to the instructions of the architect. And um, it, it was really um, Mario's translation of the original Latin that Alberti was writing in. Mario translated Alberti's text to be that the, the, the um, only responsibility of the architect was to provide sound advice and clear drawings. And sound advice and clear drawings were sufficient to actually to actualize the construction of a building. And so in, in that sort of one fell swoop, um, somehow Alberti created the profession of architecture uh, and professional liability insurance companies all sort of at the same time. And so what I want to unpack here in a, in a, in a way that's m much different, I think, than the other examinations of the archaeology of the digital is what the implications are on digital technology for the kind of I the process and iconic relationships by which buildings are delivered in Western society. And what we have in every building project today is an attempt to reconcile three strong desires and roles in the process. The client, who in my diagram here is the bubble with the C in it, aspires to have a building, but has neither the technical nor uh, financial capability to organize forces in a way that makes that building possible. The designers, the architects, are responsible for defining what is in the modern age become some, known as something called design intent. And what design intent is, is an, a legal concept that says the architect's responsible for articulating the expression of the building in its final state without any responsibility for how the final state actually arrives at that, at that particular moment. And, and I know that um, there are some intersection between the structural, contractual uh, strategies that are used in the US and here in Canada, but in the United States, the architect is prohibited from being involved in the means and methods of construction contractually. The architect is responsible for describing the end state. The contractor who is responsible for building the building is the, is, is the executioner, the, or the executor, I guess. This was a Freudian slip. Maybe executioner is not the right, right question. But um, in, this, in this construct here, where the architects deliver their services with a certain kind of legal relationship, which is about thinking, and the contractor or the builder delivers its services through a product construct, construct, creates this weird asymmetrical relationship of somebody who has the responsibility for doing a lot of thinking but not making anything, and then a contractor who just spends a lot of time making stuff but isn't really responsible for thinking about anything. And what I want to suggest to you here tonight is that the, the kinds of changes that the that technology as a catalyst is going to have in this overall structure are actually pretty profound because they affect the kind of business structures of how we work, in other words, how we deliver value into the supply chain. They affect what the, the technical term is instruments of service, which is the way as an architect you deliver your ideas to your client. They're gonna affect the roles and responsibilities of the players in this construct and ultimately affect the, both the risks and the rewards. Now, when I talk to my students about this question, there's a subtext of value proposition, and it always starts from the same place. Why is my salary so low? Why do architects make so little money? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a different lecture, but I would suggest here tonight that some of the principles that I'm gonna put forward provide us with some opportunities to explore that question in a different sort of way. Because what has happened traditionally in the building industry, at least, in the Western building industry over the last 50 years is attempts to remediate questions of risk and reward, the allocation of information, the value propositions have all been solved by creating different kinds of relationships 
between those players and those bubbles I was just showing you. Once upon a time, it was pretty simple, and then there was a whole evolution of different kinds of configurations that create different kinds of risk-reward and value relationships between the designers and the builders in any given project. And so well, I won't bore you with the details. Some of these things may be familiar to those of you in the audience who, who build, but we started out with this kind of first generation of I want a building, I design the building, I take your drawings and I build the building. Or as I like to say to my students, I design the building as the architect and then I bid them out and I dare the contractor to build the building from the drawings that the contractor was otherwise not at all involved in during the design process. And then there are variations on getting the contractor involved early as a consultant, getting the contractor involved early as a, as a protective mechanism between the client and the, con and, the, and the players, or getting the contractor involved early so he or she can involve himself or herself in the design process. Then other variations on that theme emerge, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, a little bit later. But the central thesis here that, that I want to return to again and again is that um, really the, the, there are four very distinct uh, periods of time where our technology, our representational technologies, played a part in this overall construct. And the first period of time, time era zero, if you will, is, the, uh, is what I'll call the era of drawing, or the, the time of drawing. This was before computers were involved in any representational, representational strategies. So um, this is a part of my little collection of um, drafting instruments. Uh, irony noted that a guy who spent his, most of his career building digital tools collects these things. This is a set of drafting instruments my parents gave me when I was 10 years old and I declared I wanted to be an architect. They had no idea I'd spent a third of my career making these things completely useless. Um, but, but we honed at, for, for hundreds of years, we used drawing techniques to hone a very specific set of strategies for expressing the, the, des the design intent of a building, for creating that sound advice and those, cr those, those clear drawings. And there was a time when that process was incredibly efficient and, um, and and clear, and the relationship between the design idea and the execution of the design idea was expressed in in incredibly elegant ways. This was um, this was uh, actually a drawing from the show, um, a show that was at the Yale Center for British Art a few years ago, um, called Compass and Rule, which was about how uh, mathematics plays a role in the representation of architecture. And this is a drawing by Robert Smithson from 1599 called A Round Window in a round wall. In this, in this drawing, Smithson expresses a fairly complex idea. It's, a, it's essentially a complex curve that's curving in this direction and this direction at the same time. And in this drawing, which I think is a really beautiful artifact, there are all the instructions that the stonemason needs to make the window, rotate the prefabricated parts in a circle. Here's how the proportions work. This is the plan. This is what the plan looks like without notation. That's all they needed. That's all they needed to express this window. And the, the, to put it in modern Western terms, the guys could go out in the field and build it from this drawing. Now, the shop drawings for this window in a 21st century project would probably be 300 pages long. And so when I first joined Autodesk in 2000, and I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I've, I've just tendered my resignation, so I'm on my way out the door um, actually in two weeks. But when I first joined Autodesk and we were looking at this question of the means of representation, I asked my software engineering teams the following question. What is it about the notational systems of architecture that have become so incredibly efficient that I could make, this is my drawing that I made on a small sheet of paper about the size of this, which described the construction of a small one-car garage in my backyard. And, that my, and so my team did a research project called Phil's Garage, where they asked themselves why two drawings with about 12 dimensions and five notes was enough information for a competent Yankee carpenter to go out into the field and do this. This was implied but not drawn. All of this information was implied by that drawing. All of this level of information was implied by that drawing. 
And had I chosen to do so, I could have very easily gotten my garage built with one eight and a half sheet, uh, and by 11 sheet of paper. This is something that Mario uh, subsequently characterized as the incredible CPU challenge of architecture. That what arch architectural representation is really, the, the problem of architectural representation is about CPU cycles. You're trying to represent this enormously complex thing and you have to abstract it. You have to use all kinds of abstraction strategies because you can't draw it in three dimensions. You can't draw it at full scale and you can't represent it at a molecular level. Every element of a building's representation has to be made um, using these kinds of notational characteristics. And, and for hundreds of years, this CPU constraint is what defined the process of creating the information that bridged the gap between um, design and construction. And even complex pre-blob Meister forms could be represented using these kinds of strategies. This is a drawing from um, a, show, a, a show that we had at Yale a few years ago on Saarinen. These, these are um, plan drawings of a partial plan drawings of the TWA terminal, along with all of the necessary geometry that the concrete subcontractor needed to lay out these kinds of con concrete forms, all drawn in pencil with compasses and scales and dividers and I, maybe slide rules, but I, I don't know. But the, 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 the advent of scripted form controlling software was not a necessary predicate to making complex forms. There were other kinds of controlling factors like today if you were trying to build this building you would know, you would never give the contractor that much information because it, it would be too scary and risky and you might get sued. But what, so what we did though, when, the, when we had the, the beginnings of the first CAD revolution, which really happened in the early 1990s, what we really did during the, this, the second era of representation for purposes of this discussion, is we took those, we used CPUs, we used computers to attack that CPU problem. And really what we did was we translated beautiful drawings like the Saarinen drawing I just showed you into less beautiful drawings on the surface of a monitor this is an old version. This is a screenshot of a version of AutoCAD from 2008. It felt like a big deal at the time, but it wasn't. Because really what we were doing in that translation was we were taking techniques that were well understood, drafting and CPU preservation techniques, and we were making them electronic. So instead of, a comp instead of compasses and dividers and scales, we were using line commands and later mice and higher and higher resolution computers that could do more and more, still pretty restricted in 2008. So what you, what you end up with is this very interesting contrast. Here's Smithson on the left from 1599. On the right is a shop drawing from a building that we did in Pelly's office in the late 90s. This is one shop drawing of hundreds of shop drawings of the stainless steel at the top of the Petronas Tower in Malaysia, which was a building that we had designed in New Haven the technical architect was in Kuala Lumpur. The stainless steel fabricator was in Sheffield, England. This stainless steel fabricator made this drawing by copying in his copy of AutoCAD a construction document that the associate architect, the technical architect in Kuala Lumpur had made by copying plots of drawings of the top of the building that we made in New Haven using copies of AutoCAD. So we use our copy of AutoCAD, we plot it out on a piece of paper, we roll it into a tube, we would FedEx it all the way across the world, or some other guy would roll it out and draw it again in AutoCAD, and then plot it out and then send it to some other guy. So by the time that circuit is complete and it gets back to us, you get these incredibly insightful notes like location of access panels on elevation do not agree with locations shown on dra plan drawings is my my teenage daughters used to say, no, duh, right? Because this thing, this drawing, this set of information had been represented and re-represented and FedExed around the world. And to make it worse, as the design architects, we would stamp that drawing with this block of text, which I'm familiar with because I wrote it, which basically says, we reviewed this drawing, but we take absolutely no responsibility for it whatsoever, none. You use any information, that we have marked on this drawing with a red felt tip pen at your own risk. 
And uh, the year after I joined Autodesk, our then CEO, Carol Bart, said to me, I want to know why Federal Express makes more money shipping drawings around made by our software than we make from selling the software itself. You got, I want you to try to explain that to me. And, and one of the reasons was it really wasn't, it didn't turn out to be that much of a big deal. It allowed us to do things more accurately, draw faster, and as I'll explain in a minute, that those drawing techniques were conflated with some other things that were happening in the legal and liability world. But, you know, somebody was drawing on a screen and producing the same pieces of paper that went out into the field, and then those pieces of paper, you know, coffee-stained and dog-eared, were then rolled up out of the job trailer and handed to the owner, congratulations, here's your $20 million library or your $300 million uh, corporate office building, and you can try to run that project now, operate that project for the next 50 years from these rolls of drawings. And so that, the care era, as much as it felt interesting, didn't create any tools that were particularly profound in this construct. Uh, but what probably did create an inflection point is this sort of third moment that I think we're in, which is the transition from CAD drafting to building information modeling. And what happened in the transition from CAD drafting to building information modeling is uh, we, had ni we have nicer looking screens at higher resolution, we can apply more storage, we can apply more bandwidth, we can apply more CPU power, but what we're really doing with building information modeling, as distinct from what was happening with the embryological house, is this is not just a three-dimensional model of this, I think it's a hospital. This is a behaviorally correct, parametrically constructed simulation of the building that is being proposed. So what these designers have done, in theory, is create a, a mock-up, a three-dimensional mock-up of the actual phenomenon that is occurring. And that phenomenon, distinct, when Greg used Maya to create the embryological house, he was creating three-dimensional, unintelligent geometric shapes. They had no inherent awareness of themselves as buildings. Whereas in theory, a building information model, that column knows it's a column and it knows its relationship to that wall and those pipes know that they are pipes and that they can't go through columns. And this, this database that is implied here can be queried about lots of stuff. And so what's interesting about the, the, the shift from CAD to BIM is that suddenly there's a new set of opportunities that are created. And those opportunities are about the ability to interrogate a digital version of the building prior to creating the physical version of the building. And that interrogation <laughs> might be about some simple thing like how much concrete is here, or, but, or it might be about something more complicated like how much energy is, in this, is this thing going to consume? Or what are the daylighting conditions along the perimeter? These are, I don't consider these to be particularly profound design ideas, but they do create a different kind of context in which the design process occurs really for two reasons. One is the, qual the quality of this kind of information uh, uh, creates opportunities like this, which allows the architect at some basic level to have a much deeper understanding of the implications of her design before it gets built in the, built, built in the real world. You know, there's a common um, sort of saw that you hear that, you know, architecture is unlike manufacturing because we build the, proto in manufacturing they prototype the car and they crash the car, and they test the car, and in architecture we build the prototype at, f at full scale and then we're done. There's no subsequent iteration of the problem. Well, these prototypes allow you to understand these aren't really deep, excuse me, deep problems, but they do give the architect some interesting insight into what's going on. Secondly, this turns out this information is incredibly useful to the contractor if you're willing to give it to them because there's all kinds of insight in this database about all the different kinds of things that that contractor has to do to build the building. But the question is, are you going to get into that kind of a relationship? Are you actually going to leverage that data? Is there, a value, is there in fact a value proposition involved? And so, you know, this, look guys, I've been working on this BIM thing for 14 years. This is my favorite BIM image. This is my very favorite BIM slide because this is, a, um, this is DPR, one of our construction uh, clients in California. 
This is the mechanical system from some hospital they're working on. And you look at that thing and you go, what could possibly be wrong with this building, right? <laughs> These guys have negotiated and they have represented this building with such a great deal of precision that it must be absolutely perfect. And I, I don't really think that's um, necessarily true, but what is, what is available for an image like this is that, I'll tell you, these guys have a hell of a lot more insight about this building than when they used to get two-dimensional routing diagrams from a mechanical engineer whose fee had been cut so severely that the drawings were not coordinated. And, and, they, and when they actually got in the field and started trying to thread all this thing together, it was just an, an epic nightmare of trying to piece all these things together. Again, low degree of profundity in terms of the philosophical implications, high degree of profundity in terms of the process implications. And the process implications really have to do with the magnetic force of that kind of information in this missing link between the designers and the builders. Right? There's these two relationships between the client are structurally incompatible with one another. Architects render their judgment, builders make things. You're not supposed to cross the streams, as they say in Ghostbusters, right? Whatever you do, don't cross the streams, because then you create terrible liability problems. But suddenly, the designer is in possession of incredibly powerful, interesting information that is really useful to understand how to put the building together. And so one of the results of that, um, one of the results of that newfound, uh, uh, the implication of that newfound profound information is that suddenly there's a desire to create some kind of interlocking relationship between the three, between the three parties. Unfortunately, there are very few existing constructs that allow us as architects to leverage that opportunity in any form. This is a kind of a, I used to draw this thing with a peace symbol in the middle of it, because it kind of represents a, some kind of um, new building industry molecule that, that, that is a, a different proposition for the role of architects. And if you'll indulge me for a moment in a brief um, historical digression, I'll make my point in a different sort of way. The means of representation through these different eras of drawing and CAD and BIM and beyond have, are directly correlated to the evolution of different kinds of business models in the building industry. And so back in 1970, when everything in the world was basic, whoops, I went too far. Everything in the world was basically done by good old hard bid projects. The means of representation were done with things that the young people in the, in the room are not gonna be familiar with, things called tracing paper. And um, are there enough old guys in the room here? Who remembers pin register drafting? Anyone? Yeah, see? The, the two oldest guys in the room. I, I did that, right? Big punched sheets of paper, pre-order. Pre, pre it was like the early days of layers in AutoCAD. And, and, and every, nobody sued each other. Everybody was happy. Drawings were meant to be beautiful things. Ar architects and contractors got along nicely. Then Jimmy Carter came along, raised interest rates through the roof. Energy prices became really high. People started suing each other like crazy. At the same time, computers became cheap enough for architects to use them. And suddenly a new set of ideas emerged around construction managers. We were drawing buildings with a lot of precision. We were making a lot of drawings that we had to make in order to prove that we understood the building. Drafting sets got, or drawing sets got big and more complicated and people were drawing things at multiple scales and x refing and that was all really very much in response to the presence of this new guy that came out of this problem, the construction manager. Then uh, the, enough of these projects went south that we had a liability crisis in the 1980s and everybody started getting sued and so the owner said, well, I'm really tired of suing two people. I think I'd rather just sue one person. So we had the emergence of design build and under design build, there was a conflation of the architect and the contractor. Meanwhile, the computer-aided drafting software was getting more sophisticated because the computers were getting bigger and faster, and you didn't have to just draw two lines in an arc with a door anymore. You could, you could call up this thing called a door object, and you could drop it in your drawing, and the door object knew from a drafting perspective that it was a door. So it, was the pre, it, was the, it, it knew how to cut the lines, make the space, and enter itself on a door schedule, so it was the kind of primordial ooze out of which building information modeling came. 
So we have design build in the 1990s, then we have this big downturn in the 1990s and in 2000, people start getting interested in sustainability, building information modeling emerges. And with building information modeling comes a realization that maybe these are not the answers. Maybe these various kinds of restructured business models are not in fact the solution to the overall problem. So let's experiment with some new kinds of project delivery where everybody's locked together under a single contract and lots of information gets shared and risks get shared and that's, a, that's, really, a different that's really a different conversation. But really the interest in sustainability and shared outcomes created this construct where uh, the players in the process could be more interestingly interlocked. And there are a whole series of experiments going on around this question of integrated project delivery, single contract delivery. And what, I was in uh, Japan last week, and Japan is 12 years behind the US in terms of the use of technology, maybe 14. They're just now starting to get their arms around what building information modeling is all about. But what I found fascinating is when I was there last year, they just didn't understand it at all. This year, they're starting to experiment with it, but they're also really interested in integrated project delivery. What does it mean? How do we change the relationship between the players? So that the technology itself, the efficacy of those models, the power of that information is creating a context in which the players, even in a completely different environment like Japan, are looking at the problem in a different way. But I, I largely believe that the BIM phenomenon, we can now see the end of the BIM phenomenon, because what's starting to happen now is that it, the technological infrastructure is, has profoundly changed for three reasons. Number one, cloud computing, which is infinite processing and storage speed, has, has unbound the computational problem. Com computation has always been constrained for architects because we could only get to as much CPU power as we could afford, and that was usually on our desktop. Now with your credit card, you have access to the same cloud infrastructure through Amazon S2 that my company uses to build its software. So cloud co computation com completely solves the, uh, whoops, I don't know what that is. Hold on. You guys, oh, you guys can't see that. Just a minute, I'll move it out of the way. Um, so cloud computation has unbound the problem of CPU. Also unbound the problem of storage because big complex models can be stored pretty much in any size. So you can pretty much, you can computationally you can do whatever you want to do and simultaneously you can deliver information through all sorts of internet connected devices to any point of work. So the, the, the constraints of the desktop are completely unbound. And so we're, we're actually about to enter into, a, a, in my view, a fourth age, a beyond BIM age where enormous amounts of interconnected information and enormous amounts of processing power make it possible for us to extend this idea of the predictive power of building information models into a whole, into a whole new um, realm of possibility. And the idea of simulation is gonna jump from relatively simple things like um, energy and sunlight to th this is, this is an, what's called an agent-based model this is an exiting model of, a, I think it's an oil derrick, where these designers are looking at the behavior of individual agents, each of which has been programmed to do something else. And then they set a virtual fire in this building and look at how the individual agents run out. This is much closer to a video game than an energy simulation because each one of those little yellow people has a, actually has a personality and the agents themselves behave in a context, so it's, it's actually pretty interesting. Or the combination of the ability to collect large amounts of information from the environment and then apply analytical reasoning to that. This is a project that we're working on uh, at um, Walter Netsch's, there's a little bit of extra stuff in there, Walter Netsch's um, Air Force Academy um, Chapel where we laser scanned the entire building, extrapolated a structural model from a laser scan, and did a series of analyses about the effect of wind and water on the, actual, on the model that we, that we collected from the actual environmental conditions. So again, same principle, but extrapolated to an entirely different order of magnitude um, ability to see the problem in different ways. Now, that also creates a high degree of fluidity of insight across the continuum from design to construction. These are a series of algorithms that take a building information model and test whether or not 
that project could be built as a precast concrete building. You know, it's a pretty banal idea in and of itself, except for it used to require the enormous judgment of a structural engineer in the early part of a project. This architect has articulated a, con a, a building conceptually in concrete, and we're using a series of algorithms to decide how this building should work at the level of rebar and decide whether or not it should be precast concrete. And it's all free. All this insight is completely free. So it, it, it doesn't, we didn't have to pay anyone to do this. This came forward as part of the analytical infrastructure of the building information model, and I think makes for a, a it makes for a very interesting construct because what we're saying here is that deep construction insight is now available algorithmically to the designer at the beginning of the design process, not at the end or not, pre not somehow permeated by a, by a third party consultant, but this enormous no uh, scopus of knowledge moves forward in the design process. And at the same time, if you extrapolate that idea into the next dimension, you can take these kinds of models and put them in different kinds of env environments and test the implications of your design idea. This is a project we're working on that extracts a, I, I guess I have to stop saying we now, huh? I don't work for those guys anymore, but this was a project they are working on that extracts a building information model and puts it into a gaming engine, and the gaming engine environment simulates real-time physics. So all of the artifacts that you see, this is the view from the crane operator's position, everything that's happening in this in this game is the simulation of the construction process where each of the structural elements has actual weight, is affected by the wind, is affected by the crane, the crane's carrying capacity. And what we're really doing here is playing a, con playing a construction game constrained by the rules of actual physics. So this idea of design intent versus execution is under attack from all dimensions not just because the contractor is really interested in the information that comes from the designer, but the contractor's insight because of the technology is now moving forward in the process. And one of the most interesting examples of that, have you, have you guys seen this video? Okay, so this is the Chinese air conditioner manufacturer who said to himself, I do not understand why it takes, it only takes me a day to build an air conditioner. Why does it take years to build a building? So I'm going to build an entire 30-story hotel in 14 days. So what you're seeing here is a time-lapse video of this process that they used using manufacturing techniques. And they built this uh, hotel from a clean piece of dirt to open with the dust ruffles and the ashtrays and the people working at the front desk in 14 days. Now, it's not a beautiful building. I'm told it adheres to structural codes. I don't think that's, a, a, I don't think that's something I'm going to try to test out, but what's interesting here is this is the complete conflation of both processes all at one time. It's like a building is a machine, it's, and it's something that can be, if we apply enough rigorous logic to it, we, the, there is a complete conflation of design and construction strategies. It certainly by no means makes it a thing that's beautiful, but it is a very impressive achievement. His next project, so I hear, is a, um, I think it's a thousand meter tall skyscraper in uh, either Beijing or, or um, Shanghai. Now, so what that means is that in order for this to become meaningful, the technology has got to stretch beyond just the representational. And this is where we, we reach back to the embryological house and start looking at the, the real implications of these kinds of scripted methodologies. Because what, what scripting does, and these are lots of different kinds of examples of scripts, when you, take, when you combine scripts with the idea of building information modeling, you're in a completely different world because you are manipulating, you're not just manipulating characteristics, you're now manipulating geometry. And so you are able to access the underlying represent, behavioral representation of the thing that you're working on, whether it's a road or a building or a, or a machine part. And two interesting things happen. Number one, you have the opportunity to systematically explore design alternatives in a much broader way. Number two, the knowledge that you created with that script is now permanently memorialized and usable in another context. So you've not only found a way to experiment with a lot of different kinds of options, you found a way to make a permanent record of the insight that you recorded when you created an algorithm 
instead of a direct building. So we are way past the time of using a compass to draw a line on a piece of paper that represents a building. And we're even way past using a mouse to draw a three-dimensional wall in a building information modeler to represent a wall. We're now making the rules that create the wall itself. And we're manipulating the rules. And the company, Autodesk, is experimenting with this. We're going to open a building um, uh, a research center in, in the Mars District in Toronto. And the team that's working on this is using these techniques, which are called generative design techniques, to try to generate and evaluate the design rather than create it um, in a traditional way. And that team has identified, in this case, what they consider to be eight design constraints uh, varying from adjacencies all the way through to access to daylight, all the way to a thing they're calling equality, which is the equal access to all the amenities in the building. And then they're using a series of algorithms that represent their insight about these relationships to generate a series of options for how to solve the planning of the floor plates. Now, the dilemma here, of course, is the following. Um, when we first bought our first uh, computers in Caesar's office in 1989, and we were so proud of ourselves that we had these computers and we had these plotters, and we, um, Caesar came into a design review one day, and we had plastered a wall about half the size of this screen with like many alternatives. We were, here's the A series and the B series, and here's option 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and he was horrified. Came in and he said, you guys are using these computers for the systematic generation of useless alternatives. That's not what I pay you for. I pay you to exercise your judgment, and I want you to edit these things. I don't want to see the systematic generation of useless alternatives. And so what you, this is not enough. What you have to begin to do is apply a series of rules that, uh, that look at trade-offs between various kinds of problems so you can make a choice about what's going to happen. But what I would argue is, and, and some of the work that Autodesk is doing right now, is around how you might correlate algorithmic understanding of different characteristics of a project and then begin to generate solutions that you would not have been able to generate otherwise. As a designer, you still have to make a choice. But the algorithms, the instantiated knowledge of an algorithm, in this case, this is some work with Perkins and Will to look at different configurations of a hospital floor plate using this set of, of algorithms to look at form and departmental placement and circulation and so forth, and then generate a, a set of alternatives that can be evaluated, and then the, um, the constraints can be adjusted against one another. So in, in, this is a, a tool that is being worked on called Fractal. These are the 11 or 12 variables. This designer can use a series of sliding bars to emphasize and de-emphasize different kinds of variables to find the answer that they think is, that they think is appropriate. So my point here really is that um, we're, we're seeing this really interesting uh, convergence of a lot of things that are going on. Are you still dead? Yeah, I'm going to have to reboot this whole machine. Hold on. Um, and this convergence is a set of traditions that began with the CPU-constrained representational strategies that we used as architects for hundreds of years which then transitioned, became kind of um, electronically enabled through CAD, and then became uh, behaviorally enabled through building information modeling, but really, goes now, really now goes on to a fourth realm, which is this realm of, of big data and optimization and the ability to look at and predict the outcomes of, of projects before they actually occur. If, and I guess, I'm, am I going to have to do this with no computer whatsoever? Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. It's the brain of your computer. Sorry. I apologize. Um, okay, well, let's see if... Anybody home up there? Do we have... I'm going to see if I can get this PowerPoint going while I continue to give this talk. So, what that means... Oh, I think what that means is the following, as he, as he, as he talks in the darkness here. Um, the the uh, traditional constructs of the way architects and engineers work. Okay, so 
so this idea that you can computationally generate a whole lot of alternatives, and this is a, um, a discipline that's very well understood in manufacturing called multidisciplinary optimization, where you use a computer to define the solution space for every single possibility of the interaction of a series of variables, and then you use the Pareto horizon to pick the options that are, that are the best. In this case, they are, um, they are um, looking at uh, optimizing structural strength versus choice of materials. And so the problem of design interestingly becomes one of correctly defining the problem, generating a series of answers about the problem, and then subsequently choosing the right answer and using your judgment in a different kind of way. So what I think that means is the following. That, that if you can see underneath there my traditional triangular, um, my sort of traditional triangular uh, owner, architect, contractor relationship. For a long time, the, the province of design, or the province of technology was supporting either design process, or in some cases, digital fabrication process. You extract the geometry from uh, Greg's embryological house, and you use it to drive some computer controlled machine that lets you vary the geometry. But what, what's, and, and what's happening though, now, at least in my view, is that that technological platform is now starting to expand to create a different set of potential for the entire supply chain of the building industry, which creates a different set of obligations for the players in the industry itself. Because the ability to predict what's gonna happen, to systematically explore a problem, and use the interaction of the relationships of the outcomes, creates a, a really, I think, creates a very interesting possibility for us as architects. Because what it means is that the current business model of architecture, writ very simple, goes something like this. The client says that he wants a building. The client gives the architect a certain fixed amount of money that is not largely correlated to the amount of money necessary to do the work. The architect starts working and hopes that when she's done with the project, there's some money left over. But in many cases, that turns out not to be the case. So you sort of pour money in the top and you hope that there's money left at the bottom. And the, and the results are largely uncorrelated with the value of the artifact that's being produced. The, that, value, that artifact has value because of the way it behaves and the, way, and the kinds of things that it does. And we're now starting to see the emergence of technologies that allow you to predict that. So why not leverage that prediction to change the risk, reward, and value proposition of practice and to say to clients, not only am I going to accomplish certain philosophical and aesthetic aims, but I'm, going to, I'm also going to accomplish certain kinds of performative aims, and if, I, if those things happen, I'd like to get paid for them because they create value for you. If your hospital uses fewer nurses, that's valuable. I'd like to get paid for that. If your building uses less energy, your building meets its budget. I mean, you decide what you want to measure. That's a different discussion. But this idea that performance creates an interlock between the, the responsibilities of these players, I think is a really, really interesting idea. And, and what that's going to mean is the relationship of the design process to the way architects think through the problem has got to change. This is a construct created by my um, friend and colleague Howard Ashcraft, who is a, an attorney in California who specializes in alternative project delivery strategies. And he talks about this progression of understanding a client's kind of underlying values. Why, why are they building the building? What are they trying to accomplish? How are you going to measure whether or not that's been accomplished? How are you going to set targets for how your design is going to work? And then how are you going to design? And if you can work on this kind of continuum, you can flip the business model from commoditized, fixed fee, low profit margins to relationships that have a lot more to do with, it, with values outcomes rather than commoditized interactions. And of course that means a whole other set of ideas have to happen, but the logical, the logical extension of my diagram that I showed you earlier is with all these kinds of connected systems of data, we can go from not just working together in a different kind of way, but working together based on measured performance outcomes because we now have the instruments and the tools that allow us to do that. So in my, um, and I'll just finish up with, uh, with two thoughts here. In my uh, academic work, 
uh, I'm very interested in this question, but want to apply the same principles uh, to the work that I'm doing with my students at Yale. So we've started working on a project to create a systematic um, business information model of the building industry supply chain. Because what we'd like to be able to understand is if you can change these value propositions and change the relationships between the underlying players of the process, what sorts of new ideas of value, new distributions of risk, and new performance context can you come up with? So um, one of my graduate students kind of laid out the problem last summer in a research project. And this, you can see here he started with this same kind of iconic triangular diagram and then began looking at all the different kinds of flows of influences. And we've since, um, remember when I said that a, a, an architecture firm has a very simple business model? You pour money in the top and you hope money comes out the bottom. That turns out not to be true. This is my, um, my draft uh, systems dynamics model of an architecture practice where these blue boxes all represent practice infrastructure, things like your reputation, your backlog, your staff, your overhead, the cost of your technology infrastructure, your profit, and your risk. These orange boxes represent inputs and outputs from a project. And it turns out to be a fairly complicated thing. The dynamics turn out to be pretty complex. But if we can figure out how to do this and create this sort of chip on the motherboard of the building industry, we're going to begin trying to experiment to what, with what happens if you change these value propositions to adjust the role of the architect in, in, a, in a new and I think potentially really interesting way. So I guess I'll conclude by suggesting the following. The, the decision for us as practitioners, um, particularly those of you who are going to be practicing over the next 10 or 15 years, the decisions about what you're going to do as an architect are largely going to fall along the continuum of design process options that I, at least in my view, that I've laid out tonight. Because the, the society writ large is beginning to move to an environment where the efficacy of information and the predictive value of large amounts of data is going to affect almost everything that we do. As architects, we are going to have to decide the extent to which we're going to um, take a leadership position in the, in the supply chain and decide what our role is going to be. There is no doubt in my mind that someone is going to be doing many of the things that I've described here tonight. Someone is going to take the job of using these tools and extrapolating them, taking advantage of big data and machine learning and modeling and simulation and analysis. And we'll convert those tools and those ideas into a value proposition. My proposition is if we want to maintain control of the design process, we must get good at these things. We must have a willingness to, to really lead in this regard because if we choose not to do so, uh, we, are, we will lose control of the design process entirely. And so particularly for those of you who are in the, our students are in the early part of your careers, you might want to think a little bit about whether or not the current emphasis on making cool shapes with rhino scripts is really the end point of the use of technology um, in our profession. So with that, and with apologies for the technological failure, I'm done, thank you. <laughs>